back, WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are positively getting out and about. We were in Ocean City last week doing the Mako thing. We're going to be moving around on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by our friends at Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Window Nation. You can check out all of the dates and everywhere we're going to be in the fall at BaltimorePositive.com. You know, I get books sent to me, and as a guy who – I read books, I write books, I, I sort of still like literacy and all that goes along with that and points of view and free speech and even Catcher in the Rye. Uh, I went to New York a couple of weeks ago trying to erase all that stuff. But uh, uh, when I get a big, thick book and I get a history book, I like to take a deeper dive. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. And this thing came one of the heavier books that I have received. Uh, it is Gridiron Legacy. We're talking about pro football's missing origin story and how football started. If the late, great John Stebman were alive, he would fact check this for Greg Fissery, uh, who is a Steelers fan. But we're not going to get into all those purple and black and gold wars here i'm going to welcome you on as a friend and as somebody i can learn something from because when i get a book this thick this heavy with this many pictures um yeah i've been to the pro football hall of fame bunches and bunches of times but i'm always looking to learn something greg welcome in how are you congratulations on getting this thing done man good morning nestor thank you great to be with you well, when I get one this thick and this heavy, both of my my published books were hardback and paperback, Purple Rain 1 and Purple Rain 2. There was a point, like there was a parade. I came back and I'm like, ah, oh, book, story, the story behind the story, all of that stuff. When I see these sort of history things written from a century ago or more, I really understand whoever the author is. There's a, a real passion play at work and probably didn't come up over a couple of beers over the weekend and pierogies or permanis in your case up in Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would think that you're, 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 you're probably have been a student of the game for a little while, Greg. Uh, pro- since the time I was uh, a sentient being, basically my, <laughs> I was aware uh, from family lore from my mother's mother that, uh, her father, my great grandfather, Bob Shiring, was the greatest center of the pre NFL era. And so I knew early on that there was some pro football before the NFL, but it was very nebulous. Uh, it was in some history books, some early history books back in the 70s. They're picked some of the team pictures. So I knew it was real, it was a big deal. And uh, as the internet came around I, and I was able to dig deeper, deeper, it became a real passion project and something that went from a genealogy project to a kind of a national thing. So here we are. I know all about that, man. You know, I started the News American in 1984, trying to research the 58, 59 Colts, uh, you know, how they got here, the All-America Conference, Artie Donovan's walk in the streets and Jim Parker and John Unitas. And John Stebman was like a father figure to me and his books on the greatest game ever played and all of that. So from a Baltimore perspective, it feels like, eh, you know, 49, 50 and then 54, but really kind of kicked in in 58 or 59. And there was no football before then. And then I see Navy. And Maryland and Notre Dame and college football and even going back to Three Stooges episodes, you know, in the 20s and 30s where you'd see them running around with the leather helmets and say, what was all the college? And then going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame to try to get some history on it, some research on it, the Massillon and like all it can't know Ohio and all that. Where does this come into all of that that so many folks have been out for uh, a Ray Lewis induction or a John Ogden or an Ed Reed walked around and said, well, what's the story behind the story? And where does a book like this come from? Well, that picture on the cover is the 1906 Maslin Tigers, the world champions. And my great grandfather, Bob Shiring there is holding the ball front and center as the captain, the honor that was given to the captains. So that picture hung in my grandmother's wall. So I knew that at least there's something you know. So you've seen this picture from the time you were born yeah. and said, that's my grandfather, great granddad, great grandfather. He played football and that's all. It's a picture on the wall. That's what yeah. you knew about three, it. Three pictures, two from uh, Maslin, 1905, 1906, and one that was kind of mysterious. It had an H on their sweaters, but it wasn't identified. Turned out it was the Homestead uh, Library and Athletic Club from 1901 in Pittsburgh. And they were also world champions. So that was sort of just all I had. Well, there's like baseball stuff in here, right? Like in this book. This is amazing. Well, that was Christy Mathewson. And he was maybe one of the top three pitchers of all time. And he also played college football at Bucknell. So 
he was a, sort of a, a PR stunt that they they brought him onto the 1902 Pittsburgh professional team to try to save pro football in Pittsburgh because it wasn't working out financially. And he look was at a, this team uh, here, folks. They they yeah. look like Steelers, don't they? I mean, that, that or Pirates, one or the other, right? Um, they didn't really have a nickname, oddly, that 1902 team. And Matthewson was in that one as well, sitting right next to my great grandfather, which is pretty cool. Uh, Where'd but, you get these pictures, dude? Yeah. So <laughs> in the family, that, that's why I, was, I had to do this because I inherited uh, like a hundred, uh, like never before published pictures from the, that era. And I took them to the Hall of Fame and they they were just in a, you know, a short meeting turned into a three hour meeting because they just had so many questions. And they, they ended up saying, OK, we're going to put our cards on the table here. We don't have any of this stuff. You have an original constitution here, and we need to show some of these in our exhibits. So let's work together. And it was the start of a great relationship and the start. And they encouraged me to do the book because they said I, I had something really special. And if I could add the narrative to it of this mysterious cold case of what happened in the 1906 gambling scandal that ended pro football for 10 years, basically, that it would be an amazing uh book that nobody else could do you know what you picked a hell of a time to come on because if i had the book here i would grab it but it's in the other room two weeks ago i had uh, an author on from chicago who found literally everything that was in the, the court of law from shoeless joe jackson during oh, that period of time him. i love that story yeah yeah well you know he's gone fur further in and published literally the court documents that he found and um and talking about gambling and exactly that, what I did here. I found the court file from the lawsuit that the Canton Bulldogs captain, Blondie Wallace, um, uh, took out against the Maslin Tigers team and the Maslin newspaper that accused him of colluding in this uh, gambling scandal. And he denied it. And but he never got to court because he officially ran out of money. So but I picked up that there was a court file somewhere and, and I found it and I and I. Uh, 250 pages of depositions that I sorted through and took the best parts and put in the book. So it really solves for all time that that mystery that's been hanging out there for over 100 years. It's really cool. Greg Fasari has put together a, a tomb. It is heavy. It has lots of pictures. It has lots of old stuff and really the history of football and the beginnings of football. Gridiron Legacy, Pro Football's Missing Origin Story. Um, and, and I would say this for gambling and being sort of the middle of all of this and chicanery and really the criminal underworld a century ago that now, you know, we bet on our phones. The Jetsons wouldn't believe this, right? Like where we are, but how organized crime really got its teeth into sports early on and the, and the government got involved and antitrust, like all of these governmental guardrails that were put up because sports has captivated us, I guess, since, you know, Roman times, right? But in our, in our modern culture, football, even, 115 years ago no nfl none of that but gambling bubbled up into it right the that picture you showed of christy matthewson actually had a sign on the wall behind him which was part of the reason i selected that picture it said no gambling allowed like in huge letters on the wall so they were very aware that of the risks of of, of having gamblers around the game and they were always around the game and they were always around football. The players weren't making enough money, right? Five, a hundred dollars could shove you, shove anybody at that. I mean, they make prize fight movies about that forever, right? About right. throwing the fight. But when it exactly. comes to baseball and football, this was this was big business for the for for the mobsters, for criminals. There was a story about Cy Young in the first World Series for the Red Sox in 1903 against Pittsburgh that. He they tried to offer him a bribe to you know fix games and lose games on purpose. So, um, of course, they came around and tried to get into these football games as as they were starting to become big. And one of the Maslin players was infiltrated by some gamblers with fifty thousand dollars, you know, a big pool to split amongst the players if they were willing to participate. And since my great grandfather was the captain, the story I heard to go as a kid was that he wouldn't take this bribe and that he reported it to his coach and they tried to diffuse it, but it's still kind of rumors circulated and it all still blew up in a front page story the day after the second of the two championship games between Canton and Maslin and the, the 
fallout from that just destroyed the game for 10 years until Jim Thorpe came back around in Canton and resurrected the game. How much of this did you know sort of firsthand from going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame 20 years ago and like sniffing around a little bit? And how much of this became sort of modern to you? When did this become a pet project for you? You had to turn this into something. Yeah, Um, my grandmother died in 2007. So just little story, little vignettes, basically family lore. Not not much more than I'm telling you right now. Uh, uh, But when I cleaned out her house, I discovered a the treasure in 2007, a box of pictures that I had never seen before from his football career. And that was the uh, linchpin for, for everything that came after. I knew it must it was- have been a day, right? When you find that box. Oh, the heart explodes. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, uh, re- re- really unique, special. I knew right away I had to go on a journey of discovery here. So a few years, you know, of, of Internet researching and connecting with a group in Pittsburgh called the Pro Football Researchers Association, similar to Baseball Saber, um, led me. The head of that was an old sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi guy named uh, Bob Carroll. He was one of the leading historians in football and had uh, knew Joe Horrigan, who was the head of the Hall of Fame at that time, executive director. And he said, go talk to Joe. You have something amazing here. And that one thing kept leading to another. And before you know, it's sports illustrated was on the phone with me. So. Yeah. I mean, Pete and Joe are always looking for stuff. I have this sort of thing. John Stebney gave me that I believe is the first thing that ever said super bowl on it. I've shown that to people um, because it wasn't called the super bowl. It was called the first championship game. And I have stuff from the press box. that says super bowl for super bowl one when they weren't calling it that. So, um, you know, these, these, and I've taken that to the hall of fame and said, Hey, This might be the first thing ever printed that said Super Bowl on it. You have something even further back. And, you know, when I've walked through that wing back when the the Hall of Fame was just a little circle with a water fountain and, uh, you know, little tiny hall. Now it's turned into this Disney campus over the last 10 years with the investment the league has made into it, including the field where they play that game they played a couple weeks ago. This part, how... Where was the starting point when you walked in there? Because I've seen Massillon Canton. I've seen old pictures up on the walls there for years that they had something from that. But but clearly what was in your grandmother's attic was something different. Right. It, it, It was just. A hundred times more than than what they had. They acknowledged from the beginning that Canton is the cradle of pro football, which means it was not the birthplace. They acknowledged that Pittsburgh was the birthplace, but they didn't really have much to show about that. So I had a lot to add. Um, I hate so- that this story emanates from Pittsburgh. You know what I mean? I, I'm in Baltimore. You know, I mean, it's pretty typical. I mean, wouldn't. It wouldn't be shocking, but I've always thought it was Massillon and Canton. I mean, if you would have said, where did football start? I'd say probably Massillon. I mean, I'm not the historian you are, but you're saying it started in Pittsburgh. Let's put a fine point on that. 1892, 28 years before the NFL was founded in Canton in 1920, which is why the Hall of Fame is there. The NFL was founded there, but pro football wasn't born there. So in 1892... The Allegheny Athletic Association paid $500 in cash, according to an accounting ledger discovered in the 60s by the Hall of Fame, uh, to a fellow named William Pudge Heffelfinger from Yale, who was an All-American, and they had this rivalry with the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, and uh, he came in and he scored the only touchdown on a scoop and score, as we now say, for a 4 nothing victory when touchdowns were four points, and that was the... Um, they call it the birth certificate of pro football. That account. Did he make the rules at that time then? The, you know, how, how, how did they, I guess it's an athletic club and they want to beat each other up a little bit and put leather helmets on to get a little more physical than whatever tennis or badminton or whatever. They weren't right. playing basketball then. I don't know what they're, I they, mean, they probably boxed, right? I mean, that was probably yes, an athletic club at that time. They, right? Yes, they were amateur athletic clubs and they had rivalries and they competed in AAU national championships, but you had to be amateur to be in the AAU. And if you paid anybody, you were out. So eventually they said, we're out, we're paying, we want the best players, the people want the best product. And it took off week by week more. And, and about five years later, whole teams in Pittsburgh were pro. There were basically five top uh, clubs. And, but it just never worked out business-wise. Uh, weather always got in the way, floods and snowstorms and mud piles. And, and uh, by 1902, after the Matthewson experiment, they just said, we're, we're done here. But Maslin then brought Bob Shiring, my great-grandfather, and three of his teammates out there under the table to 
uh, dominate and, and beat Akron and Canton for the state championships in Ohio. And then they all ramped up and Canton brought all the best players from a Philadelphia pro team out there. And that continued the Pittsburgh Philly rivalry that started in 1901. And um, now you're dragging Philly into this. Yeah. Uh, Philly was the second city, you know, that, that had pro football. Yeah. Um, a fellow named Blondie Wallace. He was an all American at Penn in uh, 1901 coached um, after that never actually graduated. I think he had some academic issues, but he uh, he started pro football in Philadelphia by getting Connie Mack, who was the famous manager of the, the baseball Philadelphia A's, to support this uh, idea of pro football in Philly. So they challenged Homestead in 1901 to this championship game. Uh, the, the train Homestead took to Philadelphia went off the rails. My great grandfather almost died and I would have never been born, but they made it. <laughs> they won the world championship. And uh, that rivalry um, between Wallace and, and Shiring as the two captains continued to Maslin and Canton. It just moved west and they tried to make a, a go of it there. They still never made any money, but it uh, it died after the, the gambling scandal this time instead of uh, financial reasons. So, yes, that kind of puts a little better timeline on it. 1892. Um, pro football starts, ends Pittsburgh, 1902, goes Maslin, Canton until 1906, and then blows up until 1915. Jim Thorpe comes in. But safe. they were still playing college ball then, right? And during the it, war, right? It, yeah. Well, college football started even earlier in 1869. That was, uh, we had CFB 150 in, in 2019. That was Princeton and Rutgers uh, was the first college football game. It looked a lot like it was. So the rules were set up. In, in a collegiate as to what football was. Right. It, it just slightly diverged from rugby uh, after the Civil War and into something more American uh, and unique. And every year the rules kept changing. The Ivy League being the smart, you know, the smartest people in the room that they are took over and uh, Princeton, Harvard, Yale were the big three and Yale in particular a fellow named Walter Camp became known as the father of American football, led the rules committees that changed the game every year um, and helped it become more and more unique. And the biggest year uh, for change was 1906 as well, when the forward pass was uh, uh, legalized. So that 20 some people died. That's like fire or the wheel for the invention. Yeah, of, it, right? it was, exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, the game became too violent you know, and there were people dying, 20 plus people died oh, at wow. the amateur level in 1905 from football injuries, particularly the flying wedge formation, this V-shaped thing where the runner would get behind the V and they'd attack the weakest link in the defense. And uh, so Roosevelt said, I don't want to ban the game. I like it. I like masculine Christianity and my Rough Riders unit from the war, but uh, we got to make it safer. So they created a line of scrimmage. They made 10 yards instead of five for a for first down and several other changes to try to open up the game and slowly it became a little safer but without pads and helmets most of the time there's not much you can do and there's still not much <laughs> yeah uh, yeah damar hamlin's family and anybody that plays the game would know that greg fissery has written a book it's called gridiron legacy it is heavy it is thick it is historical it's got a lot of great pictures in it uh you can check it out pro football's missing origin story um and really kind of a, uh, an accompaniment to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, at least uh, as far as storytelling goes in the beginning. Uh, available out. Makes a perfect holiday gift, right, Greg? Right, and let me drop in, speaking of the Hall of Fame, in that rotunda is a timeline and in the very first exhibit is something I discovered that they call the Holy Grail of Pro Football. I, I discovered the, the first known uh, two Pro Football Championship trophies from 1900 and 1901, that Homestead team uh, are now on display at the Hall of Fame. So that was my contribution to to them. Well, hey, man, take care of yourself. Good luck with this this book. Are you done? Or is, are you like Rocky one? Don't want it done, no rematch? Or uh, you're not maybe, gonna write the second volume of this one, huh? Uh, well, Jerome Bettis called it the, the book of Genesis of pro football. So I, I don't know if what came after Genesis, I forget, Deuteronomy or something. But um, 
There could be a paperback in there for you mentioned how heavy to you know people might want to take it to the beach and on the plane. So it might be version one point five. But your your forwards written by the late great Franco Harris. That sounds a little weird even saying that. But uh, Fra Franco forged a relationship with you during during your journey. Yes, he's what a wonderful man. He he was the head was. of yeah. a, uh, a, a the uh, advisory board called the Champions Committee at the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh, and I was uh, on that board with him. And he was such a passionate uh, football historian that he gravitated to my project and offered to help me proact, which was amazing. And when I was done writing, you know, he he was uh, willing to do the forward, and we we just had a lot of fun going back and forth and editing. And, and uh, <laughs> I had a suggestion for him at the end. I said, how about we close it with it's immaculate. And he just said, uh, ah. <laughs> so uh, he said, let, let me work on that. And, and so he came up with his own ending, but Frenchie Fuqua, his teammate ended up using that line in, in the quote uh, in the book instead. So I, well, I would say this, the Baltimore-Pittsburgh rivalry, alive and well as we enter our uh, 28th year in the National Football League uh, back uh, after they threw us out. They had gambling a century ago. We had Bob Ursay here that took us out for a dozen years. So uh, uh, but we're back. You know this. And it's going to be a great season. And really, good luck. I know it, it took years for this thing to happen. I understand from an author's standpoint. I love having authors on, especially when I learn something. And I learned something today. So I appreciate you, Greg. Thank you for having me on. It's been great. You got it. Greg Fistery joining us here. The book is Gridiron Legacy. I'm going to hold it up again. I'm, I'm, I'm lifting weights, uh, holding it up. Pro Football's Missing Origin Story. Go check it out. Great pictures, great vibe, and great history, because I know I have a lot of history majors out there who love this stuff. Uh, I am Nestor. I'm back out on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. We're going to be at Pappas on the 29th, uh, back at Fadley's on the 15th. It's all brought to you by our friends at the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with Window Nation 86690 Nation. Luke's at Owings Mills. Luke's at Camden Yard. We've got good things happening here in Baltimore on the sports scene. Stay with us. We're Baltimore Positive.